Personally, it doesn't take very much to get me to read Dragon Fantasy. But if you guys need a reason to, well, uh, by blade and by blood, I got you. So let's take a look, guys, at The Bound and the Broken by Ryan Cahill. There is not a soul in this world who does not feel the push and pull of pride. Damage it, and you can make an enemy for life. Keep it intact, and you may find allies in the strangest of places. We honor the dead not by how we mourn their death, but how we live on despite it. There are demons within us all that we must face. They only ever surface when we are at our lowest, because they are not strong enough to challenge us at our highest. We are born, we live, and we die. Those three things cannot be changed. The only thing within our control is what we choose to do with the short time that we have. The things we fight for, the people we love, the things that we hold dear. Good men stand even when it is against all odds. The world chews us up and spits us out. It doesn't care if we live or die. It doesn't care who we love or who we hate. It is filled with misery, death, and loss. It cares little for us. But that is precisely why we must care with all of our hearts and fight for the ones that we love and stand for what we believe in. Because in a world where nothing matters, what matters to us means everything. If we forget about the ones we love, everything loses meaning. Love cannot be quantified by the how and the why. It is the intangible tether that connects your heart to others. It holds no conditions or rules, for if it did, it would not be love, but simply convenience. One should not simply wish to live. They should wish to live in a way that they deem to be right. Nothing worth having is ever easy, and nothing that's easy is ever worth having. We hold our failures close so as to learn from them. We take pride in them because failing means you try. You can only ever succeed if you allow yourself to fail. The past is the tapestry from which we all must learn the steps we should not take. What I've noticed is those who describe themselves as good men are often far front. And those whom others describe as good men tend to have a nasty habit of dying young. The sun will set and it will rise again, and it will do so the next day and the next. The gods are in charge of such things, but it is by our own will that we pick ourselves up when we fall. Mastery is not something you achieve based on the speed at which you improve, but due to your ability to persevere in the face of failure. Besides, there is nothing more important in the darkness than a ray of light. Prophecies and fate are words that are used by kings and queens to send young men and women to their deaths with smiles on their faces, dreaming of becoming heroes. Fate is fluid, and your destiny is in your own hands, nobody else's. Hey, what's up, bookworms? We are back with another Why You Should Read, guys. Today, we're going to be talking about the self-published fantasy series, The Bound and the Broken, by Mr. Ryan Cahill. Now, this is released uh, starting in 2021. We've had subsequent releases uh, ever since then. It's still ongoing. Independently released by Ryan Cahill, comprised currently of three novels and three novellas. Now, guys, before I get too far on this, I want to give credit to my good friend Patrick over at Patrick Reads. Now, Patrick, I want to give him the hat tip because I know there'll be a lot of people being like, hey, you just made a video called Why You Should Read The Bound and the Broken. Patrick already made a video called the Why You Should Read The Bound and the Broken. I'm going to be honest, guys, before anyone accuses me of not giving Patrick credit, he deserves full credit for this because outside of prying eyes, Patrick and I do have like a message thread that we've had going for a couple of years now because sometimes we want to talk about stuff without getting anybody interjecting. You know, full-on Illuminati stuff. We don't want anybody to know about. But uh, one series I have been constantly recommending to him for a few years now, and this is perfect timing because he just read it and he just reviewed it. I've been trying to get him to read Sun Eater by Christopher Rocchio because I just knew that that would be one that absolutely clicks with him. And he's like, yeah, it might be the best debut sci-fi novel I've ever read. So I was right. The one he always recommended to me, guys, 
of Fire and Blood by Ryan Cahill. He just said, I think that, uh, or I'm sorry, of, of Blood and Fire. I always say it backwards every time. It won't be the last time this video. But he's been saying for a while now, I, I know you're not really into the self-pub thing yet, because I wasn't. It's something that has kind of come on recently, and it's a big reason. It's because of the series. Patrick was always saying, I think that this is going to be one that just clicks with you. And by God, he was right. So, Patrick, you are the man. You continue to be the greatest salesman in the fantasy universe. So thank you for that. Now, I read The Fall Guys in February, and then I did one per month after that. I already did a video on the channel because uh, so many people ask me, where should I start? Should I start with a blood and fire? Should I... <laughs> Of Blood and Fire. I said it right that time. Of Blood and Fire, should I start with the fall? And I answered that question in that video. So I'm not going to really kind of go over that again in this video, but there is some content already on the channel. I have also interviewed Ryan on the channel if you want to uh, hear a little bit more from him about what goes into the process of being a successful self-published author. But guys, we're going to talk about the whole series today and what it is about. And beginning with what is it about, well, I decided today... Why don't I go ahead and let the creator tell you what it is about. Ryan? Ryan! Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi. That didn't work. Hi. Too far. Too far. Hi. <laughs> Focus. Hey. My name's Ryan. Uh, my name's Ryan. Cahill or Cahill or whatever it is pronounced, I really don't mind. Mike has asked me to basically tell you what The Bell and the Broken is about. I am not used to being in front of a camera, so we'll see how this goes. I'm also terrible at summarizing these kinds of things, so yeah. Here's an axe. Let's start with something everyone loves, a history lesson. About 3,000 years before the first book in the series is set, uh, the continent of Fury is pitched in like, this horrifically, like, horribly bloody war um, between, like, numerous factions of all the different races of elves and Jotnar, who are, like, you know, big eight-foot blue guys, nine, ten feet. Um, there's other races involved, but the elves and the Jotnar are kind of, like, the dominant forces because, you know, they ride dragons, and that kind of, you know, trumps pretty much everything. Because these dragons... I'm using a lot of Italian hand movements. Mamma mia. These dragons aren't the kind of like talky, haha kind of dragons. They're more the the beastie, hundreds of feet long, set you on fire and rip you to pieces kind of dragons. After like a cataclysmic event that kind of like, you know, just fucks everyone up. Can I curse? I could probably curse. There's, there's cursing in the books. I'm Irish, it's part of my culture, so. After this event, all the races kind of get together and form a group called the Order which is essentially there to protect the entire continent. Core part of this group are the Dralid, which translates to the Dragon Belt. So they're essentially people whose souls are bonded to dragons, which is pretty fucking cool. Cursed again. For the next two and a half thousand years or so, the Order and the Dralid protect the continent from outside threats and in general do a pretty decent job of stopping everyone from, you know, slaughtering each other, as you do. And as happens in any good fantasy, Eventually, they're betrayed from within and kind of ripped to pieces in an event that becomes known as the Fall. So the first book in The Bell of the Broken takes place about 400 years after the Fall. And in that time, no new dragon eggs have hatched and only nine dragons and their dralate are still alive. All of whom serve the empire that rose in the Order's Ashes. Those four centuries from then until now have basically been unending war. As the survivors of the Fall, led by a guy called Aeson Verander, stop at nothing to bring the empire to its knees. It's going to burn the shit out of it. So we'll do a quick blurb, which is easiest. Etheria is a land divided by war and mistrust. The high lords of the south squabble and fight, only kept in check by the dragon guard, traitors of a time long past who served the empire of the north. In the remote villages of southern Etheria, still reeling from the tragic loss of his brother, Caelan Briar prepares for the proving, a test of courage and skill that not all survive. But when three strangers arrive in the village of Milltown with a secret they're willing to die for, Caelan's world is ripped from under him and he is thrust headfirst into a war that has been raging for centuries. There is no prophecy. His coming was not foretold. He bleeds like any man and bleed he will. So, in general, if you like fantasy that's, you know, dark and gritty and bloody and kind of deals with all that and deals with the, the heavy emotional scale of that, 
but it also has a real classic fantasy feel and kind of harks back to the nostalgia of the fantasy you love growing up and is full of characters who are willing to die for the ones they love. I think you might have a bit of fun with this series. There's elves, dwarves, giants, dragons, uh, gods, and a host of other races, along with a faction called the Knights of Acheron, who are kind of like if the Knights Templar were powered by an actual god and could then forge swords from their souls. And they also had space marine power armor that functioned like Iron Man, but fantasy. The characters are complex. The world has thousands of years of history, its own languages, multiple races, political intrigue, and countless warring factions. The more you go on, the less you know who the good guys and the bad guys are. Good guys and bad guys. The plots twist and weave. And there are hopefully a few things you do not see coming. So if any of that sounds like it might be up your street, you know, give it a go. So thank you for that uh, illuminating description, Ryan. Hey, you should be a writer. You're very, very good at this. Guys, we're going to get into it now. What makes this series good or bad? Good, I got to say, guys, the character work is some of the finest I have read in modern fantasy. It is so good. And the thing that's amazing about it is there's so many characters in this story and yet you find yourself getting development for each one of these characters over the over you know what what has uh what has gotten them to this point what are some of their failures what are some of their successes what are their life goals things like that over the course of this series you get to know more and more about them what starts as just your traditional you know uh boy leaves home kind of storyline that you would think in any kind of traditional fantasy series it evolves into something so much more and with such a large cast of characters that you would just become increasingly endeared to and not just the heroes per se now this is traditional fantasy guys but it's 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 not any one of those things where you know everyone's obsessed now with morally gray characters uh look there are people in this series where you'll be like, okay, that's who I should be rooting for. And that's probably who I should be rooting against. But as the series keeps going, you get some things from what you think might be the villains and you see, wow, they don't they don't consider themselves the villains. And by God, if they aren't making a lot of sense right now. So I think that's a fine line there where it's not necessarily that there isn't a good versus evil kind of story. It's just not quite as, you know, morally white, morally black, like you would see in a lot of traditional fantasies there is still like a a dark lord and things like that that's stuff that i'm never ever gonna get tired of when it comes to this genre but i do think that there are so many layers to these characters and his character work is just it's really good guys because even when you, you'll get a story like this and you'll really be vibing with the character then he introduces somebody new and you're like well what are we doing what are we doing i got this tight knit group of characters why am i getting introduced to so many new ones and by God, if you aren't at the end of that book and you're like, I want more of that character. That happened to me in book two. Dane is now my favorite character in the series. And when he first popped up, I was like, what the heck is this? Why are we visiting this corner of the land we haven't really seen yet? And that's another thing that he does incredibly well, guys. He continues to expand this continent and just gives us more and more, a little bit at a time. He doesn't just throw you into it and say, hey, figure out where all this is. He doesn't overwhelm you. And I think that's what makes the series get better as it goes along, as he keeps expanding the world, but he does it at a pace to where it's not going to really confuse the reader. But this world is massive, guys. And what an awesome map. He's got a really kick-ass high-res map on his uh, his website, which I downloaded on my phone. You can like zoom in. It's like super high-res. Great, great idea. So yeah, if you saw my blurb that first on the ice the novella just came out you see that i said that i feel like this is the most epic and sprawling and growing world uh just in a scale of scope i haven't seen since the song of ice and fire and that's the highest credit i can give anything guys because you know that's that's my series right and it's one of those things i think that gets confused when i say that people are like, oh so you're saying it's like a song of ice and fire no i'm saying song of ice and fire fans will appreciate the way that he does his world building because it's done incredibly well and you want to know more you just want to keep knowing more you want to know more about these houses you want to know about their how they're rise to power what was their fall from grace what are their ancient feuds with these other houses and things like that it's that kind of stuff those kind of politics that make a story like this really really click well and he's really damn good at it and that's that's where i compare it to something like a song of ice and fire as opposed to all the people who want to compare it to wheel of time and we'll get into that here in a little bit but again guys he just continues to grow this world in a way that's so organic and so well paced that you're going to be all involved into when you do get a new location new characters you're gonna be like oh okay great i want to know about these people now i want to know what's going on in this corner of a period that's what makes this world tick so learning the histories learning the lore the myths of this land are never something that makes it feel 
feel like homework. You know, a lot of series like this, I can get very, very info dumpy and you'll be like, okay, it's time for another history lesson. I never feel like it's done that way. Also, another thing about that is having a character that is a bard or like a storyteller travel with our main characters gives an actual reason for exposition to come out without it being like, why is this character giving me a history lesson? You know, it actually feels like, okay, this actually makes sense the way he's done. So that's a, that's a genius plot story device. I love the way that he does that. It just continues to increase that plot and tell us a little bit more about the world that you'll want to know a little bites. And guys, did I mention dragons? Okay, look, dragons and wyverns. Is it wyverns or is it wyverns? I'm never going to be quite sure because every time I call it wyverns, someone says it's wyverns dude. Every time I say wyverns, hey, it's wyverns, man. So uh, who knows? Who knows? So you know what I mean? Yeah, those things, those things. There's those two, but God, dragons play such a huge part in the story, obviously. Uh, I think that dragons is one of the things that brought me to this genre. You know, that's 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 awesome. That's something I'm always... You're never going to hear me complain about it, I think. But he does something a little different with them in this one that really, really makes it really just feel fresh to me and not in a way that like, I mean, other dragon rider fantasies had similar things, you know, that bond between the dragon and the rider. And when one gets hurt, the other one feels it. When one dies, it ruins the other one kind of thing. But it's done in this one in just a way that's just so visceral, so real. And you feel that emotion, that connection between a rider and a dragon in a way that you would, you know, uh, someone like between lovers. It really is like that intimate without being sexual, obviously. It's not that kind of fantasy story, guys. But I think that uh, you really do feel it. You feel the relationship between the rider and the dragon in a way that I don't think I've ever encountered in any other dragon rider type fantasy before. So he just continues to just knock that one out of the park but with these dragons man, ryan just does these scenes that are just so freaking grand and epic in scope that where you think there's no way they could ever like adapt this to film because it would be the most expensive movie ever made it's just he writes those huge epic scenes like i haven't seen before it just feels so big like it's popping off the page and it's just those moments are just so amazing. You're just like your jaws drop on the floor. Like how? How in the world? That's why I encourage people to start with the fall, because the fall shows all this. Whereas a blood and fire, you kind of get hints of, but you don't ever really see it. See it like you do in the fall. And I think the fall gives you a great example of how this story is going to evolve over time. And it's, it's one of those things, guys, where it, the series literally does get better every book. And it's hard to believe because it starts so damn strong, but it does. It just it gets bigger and bigger, and it just gets more epic. And I know epic is a word that gets overused, but man, I can't think of one. But the fact when he asked me to write a blurb, I almost just said epic as fuck. But I, you know, he's an independent author; he could get away with that. But you know, I would like to actually be asked to be on more blurbs in the future, so I didn't do that. But I think the way that Ryan is able to juggle multiple plot lines, this is something not all authors can do. In the third book in the series, which is one of the biggest books I've ever read in my life, guys, Of War and Ruin. This book is monstrous. It's longer than A Storm of Swords. And that won't be the last time you hear me bring up Storm of Swords in this review. Is He's got at least a dozen, 13, 14 major plot threads that are going on at the same time. And never once are you like, oh, not this character again. Or, hey, I want to get back to these characters. He juggles it so flawlessly that you're like, oh, of course, that's natural. That's where we would go back to at this point. If this was a screenplay, this is the way it would be played out. And you would get to visit these characters at different times. And then it gets to the point where, you know, they start crossing over. And it's just so well done. And the guy, it's amazing how he's able to do that. And what's so incredible about it is it has that many plot threads. And I could think right now, what was my least favorite plot thread in there? And it is better than 95% of the fantasy that I've read since I started this channel. That's how good that book is. That's how good this series does get, guys. And I love this dialogue. It's very snappy. Uh, there, there's bad language. Uh, so if you're one of those who are scared of bad language, this is an adult fantasy book. I know a lot of people will compare it to traditional fantasy like a Shannara or a Wheel of Time. So like that. No, it's, 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 it's more adult than that. It doesn't quite get to like Joe Abercrombie levels of adult, but it's to the point where it's, uh, yeah, yeah, they're going to cuss. There's going to be violence and things like that. So that, that's going to happen. But the dialogue, it, what I love about it is you got these young teenage characters and they talk like you would imagine kids that age would talk to each other in this world, in this setting. It never feels like it's something that's, 
you know, meta, like out of this world or anything like that. But it also never feels like no one would actually say that. It feels like characters that age in this world would talk to each other like that. And that's a, that's, that, that's a nice skill. It's, that's very well done. I think the magic system, just right. It's just right. It, it doesn't really super, super explain it. He doesn't, you know, smell his own farts too much to tell you about how the sausage is made here. It's It's got a nice magic system. But if you're wanting like a Brandon Sanderson level, like an explanation for how it works, mm -mm, that's it. They do magic because they can. And that's plenty for me. I don't need to understand. Like I said, guys, I grew up reading Lord of the Rings. Gandalf can do magic because he's a wizard. That's a good enough explanation for me. So these people that can do magic, he talks about why or how some can can do it and some cannot do it, but he never goes into the science of it all. And that's fine with me. And what I love guys is everything in these books matter. It's fresh and original ideas in a fantasy landscape. It somehow feels modern, but you never once get that thing where there's 30 or 40 pages where you're like, I didn't need to know all that. It never ever feels like there is a single wasted page in the series, everything comes back around to mean something. And that's amazing, guys, because you, you see a book like Of War Ruin that's that massive, and you think, ah, maybe he let it get away from a little bit there. Maybe he should have cut some down. Absolutely not. That's uh, It's amazing how he's able to do that. Every damn page matters, and that's just, that's just incredible. But yeah, guys, this is adult fantasy. Bad things happen. Characters die. There's bad language. There's violence. So uh, buyer beware on there. But uh, to me, it feels like traditional fantasy of something that I would have read when I was younger, but it grew as I grew. You know, so it still has all those familiar hat tips, all those allusions to things that I loved when I first discovered the genre, but they have now grown up with me and they feel like they are the target demo is people who've been reading fantasy for a long time and they want something adult, but it doesn't have to be, you know, just hopeless and grim and gritty and all that stuff. It's still very fantastical, very enjoyable, but there are, you know, a lot of adult issues and a lot of bad things that will happen over the course of this series. So how about the bad guys? Are there some bad things here? I don't necessarily think these are bad, but I will say these are some problems that others might have with it. Some may feel it is too derivative of other works. Now, Wheel of Time fans really, really love to put this, point this out. Uh, they talk about uh, that there's, you know, there's a trio of, of guy friends at the very beginning. And, and I mean, the thing about that, guys, is I don't think that Wheel of Time created these things i mean let's 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 examine this for a minute group of young guy friends leave their town uh they're chased by shadowy figures that that uh you know work for the villains it feels like a hat tip to another very famous series doesn't it it's not will of time so uh yeah and wheelies calm down calm down there are other fantasy series before wheel of time and Will of Time did those same allusions to J.R.R. Tolkien. So it's, it's I, I don't see it as that, but I will say that has been a hang up for some people. What I'll say is trust the process, guys, because when you get to book two, just like Will of Time, wow, it takes a big, big turn and it does its own thing. And it's completely fresh and original and you will be hooked. So uh, yeah, yeah, I just say this, just, just trust the process in that regard. Uh, I, I think it's that it's not grimdark is something that some people will criticize because I feel like anyone who reads adult fantasy or anyone that's, you know, close to my age, uh, well, I have to have it be grim darker. I'm just not interested. I'm not interested in, you know, a happy-go-lucky, goody-two-shoes characters and stuff like that. You can have good characters that aren't quite like you're thinking, you know? You can have those characters who are very realistic adult characters and make adult decisions, but they aren't necessarily just scum of the earth like some grimdark characters are, you know? So I don't see that as a negative. And for me, guys, it's okay every once in a while to kind of go back to something like that that's not just crawling in the muck 24-7. And, you know, hey, maybe you let a little bit of sunshine touch your face again. You know, that's not so bad. But uh, again, I think this is an adult, an adult series. But uh, if you're wanting you know, just straight up hopelessness. I don't think you're going to get that with this series. So I don't, I don't, I don't consider that a bad thing. Nor do I consider that the books are very long a bad thing. Look, I, these these books aren't short, and look, they get longer. They get longer and longer. And uh, if it was one of those things where I said I feel like it could be cut down, uh, then then I would say that's actually something I would consider bad. But I don't because. Like I keep saying, I don't feel like there's a wasted page in this series. Everything that he's written has come back around to mean something, and he never spends up too much time on exposition to where you just feel like you're going to school. You know, so I, I don't consider that a, a negative. But if you're just tired of 
doorstopper books. I mean, fantasy might not be the genre for you, but uh, yeah, if you're looking for something shorter, I guess you could saw that, say that's bad. And then the series isn't done yet. I talked about this recently, guys. You know, series that aren't done yet, a lot of my viewers will say, that sounds like a great series, but I've been burned by George. I've been burned by Patrick Rothfuss. I'm not starting another series until they are complete. What I'll say about this, guys, is see how long those books are? He's put one of those out every single year, you know, since he started writing those. So he writes at light speed. He writes at a Brandon Sanderson clip. I mean, he's revealing the cover for book number four today, and he's still writing it. That's how confident he is that he's going to be able to pump this book out. So I, I'm not worried about that. And I think when you read books this long, you kind of need a little bit of a breather period between some of them. But he's going to be putting out one of these a year because he's self-published. He's able to churn them out really quick. You know, he doesn't have the 13, 14 month turnaround that, you know, a major published author would have. So I don't think that that would be something that you could consider bad. But if you are just a stickler, you are not trusting another fantasy author, then that might be something that's bad for you. It might be something bad if you have to wait for the series to be finished. As for my final thoughts, guys, look, uh, I have been waiting a long time, a long time, like almost 25 years now for another series just to just completely lose myself into like I did when I first discovered A Song of Ice and Fire where I become just obsessed with it, where I just want to dive into that world. I want to study the maps. I want to look at the family trees. I want to know about who stabbed who in the back way back when, and four generations later, there's still so much hatred between those houses. I want to know everything about this world. I want to know everything from the fall all the way to where the story is now. I want to know all these things. That's why I love his novellas. That's the thing, guys. If you want to know more about this world, I don't say those novellas are anything you have to read, but unlike other series, they feel like something that if you will want to read them because they give so much context to other things. Like it talks about this exile of this one character in book two. And you're like, well, how did that happen? Hey, read the exile. It'll explain to you why that character's like that. Hey, how do they end up with this uh, magical artifact that they have in the first book? Read the ice. It will tell you that story about how those characters got that stuff. So it's one of those things where a lot of these series like this, they'll put out those novellas and then you read them. You're like, ah, it was really fluff. You could skip them. These, it's like, I'm not telling you you have to read them to make sense because they don't. They, they don't. You do not have to read them for the series to make sense, but you'll want to because they give you so many answers that you're going to want. And uh, it's, 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 it's just really well done. I mean, it's, the way he is constructing the series out of timeline order, you know, with these novellas, it's just quite remarkable. I feel like they, they, they really add so much to this world, just making it feel bigger. And it's just, I, I just, I've been looking for this, guys. I have been waiting for a long time. There's been several fantasy series that I have loved since I have been running this channel, but none that I ever was to the point where I was like, I am just obsessed. I can't think about anything else. I am just, oh my God, I cannot wait for the next book. That kind of thing. I haven't had, I mean, I've, had, I've, I've loved Wheel of Time. You know, I have loved reading Realm of the Elders, things like that, but I've never been to the point where I'm like, I the last thing I think about when I'm falling asleep. You know, it's never been like that. And I feel like this is the first one since Song of Ice and Fire where I've really just been so interested in what makes that world tick, you know, and I needed that. I really did need that. So it was just perfect timing for me, I think. I needed something that was somewhat traditional fantasy, like I said, but I feel like it had grown up along with me as I, to where I am as a reader now. And that's just, that's hard to, hard to capture. And I feel like it really has. And that's why I have got to recommend this series to everyone who has watched this channel. You know, every line feels important. Every page matters. And it's just, this this story is just so rich and vibrant. And there's just so much more to want to know. And these books just get longer and longer and you don't want them to end. That's amazing. It really, really is. So it's one of those rare series, guys, where he does improve with every single novel. And lastly, I got to say, guys, if you are like I was probably about a year ago, don't let the fact that Ryan is a self-published author deter you. Ryan has an incredible process. He, uh, he the, the, how he goes through his editing, through his alpha readers and things like that. And it, it, he, I've never seen as much as a comma out of place in his book. So if you're worried about that, guys, don't be. Don't be. Uh, the books, if you hadn't told me that they were self-published, I probably would not have known. So please don't let that deter you because it's just... You're going to have a great, great time with it. And the best part of all, guys, you can start right now for free. He gives away the fall novella for free 
on his website, all you gotta do is put in your email. Boom, there you go. You've got the first book in the series. So uh, I guess I just gotta say, if you uh, haven't done this yet, guys, please do. I think that your life will be better for it as a reader if you've been looking for that series to scratch that Song of Ice and Fire itch that George just hasn't given us in quite a while, then I think maybe this might be the one that you are looking for. And again, I will implore you, if you read the first book and you're like, ah, it was fine, please trust the process. Please trust the process because it's going to be so worth it, guys. It is going to pay off so much, and I am almost guaranteeing you're going to be just as obsessed with it as I I am almost all my patrons have read this now and they're obsessed with it just like I am because it's just amazing. And I only do the Why You Should Read for series that I am pretty damn sure you're going to love if you give it a try. And this one, you will love it if you give it a try. And lastly, I want to say to Ryan, if he does watch this, that uh, I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for giving me this series. And uh, lastly, what are you doing right now? Wasting time. Get back to work. What are you doing? I'm caught up now. I need book number four. So uh, not really, but uh, but really, really, I do. You can go ahead and you just go ahead and send me those sample chapters as you finish them. But guys, that is The Bound and the Broken. Have you read it? What did you think? Drop in the comments, guys, and let me know, and I will talk to you there.